Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon for the DBS presentation with Dr. Van Sickle. And thank you to Cindy as well, who is from Abbott, who is sponsoring today's presentation. Uh, before we get going, I've got a couple of different housekeeping, housekeeping items. Uh, we do have a Q&A session built in at the end of the presentation. So when and if you have questions, there are a couple of different ways that you can submit those. The first is by using the drop down menu at the side of the side panel for your go to webinar. You can drop that, that down, type in your question. That'll be sent directly to me and I will either answer it for, for you or we'll pass it along to Dr. Van Sigler or Cindy. The second option for all of you is there is a raise your hand function. You can go ahead and raise your hand. I will unmute you on your microphone and you can ask the question verbally at the end of the session. Please, if you do this, make sure that you have your microphone enabled so that way we can hear you. There are some pre-submitted questions that I can ask as well if they're not answered during the presentation, but if you have any others, please either type them in or raise your hand. Uh, a couple of things from the Parkinson Association. We've got a couple of upcoming upcoming programs. The first is actually tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. with uh, on a non-motor symptom webinar and that is with Drs. Carolyn Golden and Teresa Lee from the university and that's from 10 a.m. to noon. You can find the login information for that in one of your handouts entitled PAR Available Programs. The other one will be happening next week and that'll be on vision changes in Parkinson's, and that's going to be with Dr. Pellick from the university as well. Okay, so I think that's all from me, so I'll go ahead and let Cindy from Abbott take over. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yes. I'm Cindy Kirkendall. I'm the territory manager for Abbott in Colorado, and I wanted to, again, just, couple housekeeping things. Uh, as you see on the right-hand side of the screen, Anna has posted some online education resources. So you can download those following the call. And if you can take a minute, the DBS ACT card is an Abbott Care card. If you can fill that out, send it in, either email or fax, we will keep you posted of updates on DBS as they become available. I also wanted to thank PAR for allowing us to co-host the sem seminar today. In recent times, we've had significant changes in the technology that physicians are using to deliver the DBS stimulation and implant the DBS electrodes, as well as the actual components of the system as well. So today is really an attempt to update uh, community on what's available, both from a technology perspective, as well as the impact of some of the new implanted components and technology that is currently available. So Dr. Van Sickle will detail us and go through that information in, um, in, more, in more detail. So I'd like to introduce Dr. David Van Sickle. He is a neurosurgeon who practices at Neurosurgery One in Littleton, Colorado. He has his doctorate in bioengineering and a medical degree from the University of Pittsburgh. He completed a neurosurgery residency at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center. Dr. Van Sickle, Van Sickle uh, specializes in functional neurosurgery, which includes deep brain stimulation. He was the first in the world to perform a sleep robotic DBS and continues to publish data and teach physicians from around the world this technique. He's also the founder of the Denver DBS Center. Dr. Van Sickle is passionate uh, and is an advocate for those with Parkinson's disease and continues to push advances in the DBS procedure to ensure the best outcomes for his patients. So with that, I'll let Dr. Van Sickle take the mic. I believe that I've enabled this and everybody can hear me. Hopefully they can. Um, thank you all for joining. Uh, it's uh, very different than I'm used to. Um, where uh, I usually have a live audience and I can, I can talk to people and interact with them directly. So now I'm uh, interacting in a more virtual way. The, uh, we have the first slide up here. So let's go on, get right into it and we'll talk about uh, some of the things that are going on in the deep brain simulation space. 
I want to start off with a video, and I'm going to narrate this video a little bit as it plays. And the, this is my very first patient I ever operated on. The surgery was done awake. Um, and I can see it's a little glitchy here, uh, trying to show it on the screen. So right up here on the upper left, this is before deep brain stimulation. So this patient has, is moves slowly, uh, has no arm swing on this left arm, left or on the right. Facial expression is masked, shuffles along. Um, but yet after surgery, we'll look at that on the lower right. And maybe if I pause this, the one down here will play better. If I get this to play. Let's try to back it up here. After surgery, he walks normally. Arm swing is relatively equal on both sides. Facial expression is improved. And you'll see the speed of the finger tapping now has returned to normal with some pauses due to computer problems that we're having here, uh, trying to transmit that. And you'll see that he can tap his toes on a regular basis, uh, all of which he couldn't do prior to surgery. It was because of this individual that I went on to try to perfect deep brain stimulation. I saw these fantastic results uh, and wondered, well, why wouldn't everybody want this surgery? Until I realized that the problem was the surgery itself. And so uh, we've, I've spent really my entire career making uh, strides to make the surgery itself better. So what is DBS? So DBS fundamentally is a pacemaker for the brain. Many of you may already know that. It's a implanted, uh, a pacemaker-like device with a wire that goes up under the skin and then electrodes that go deep into the brain. It can be controlled by remote control. This is an example of a controller that your doctor might use, and this is a controller that you might use, and these are some of the devices that might be implanted, and this is the size of the actual electrode that might be implanted. The targets in the brain are very tiny. This is uh, typically for Parkinson's disease, we would use the subthalamic nucleus and the globus pallidus internus, so the STN or the GPI. The GPI is this inner green area, and we actually want to hit just sort of this one edge of it right here. And so you can see the size of this brain. This is only a, a millimeter, millimeter and a half area where you can actually get it and you have a good result. The subthalamic nucleus is even smaller. That's this almond-shaped area uh, in light brown and you wanna hit the back edge of this, and if you miss, then somebody won't get a good result. So getting a good result is all about really archery. It's getting the lead in, in just exactly the right place. So how does this work? This is a little cartoon that I, I, I cribbed off the internet. So if you imagine this is a neuron and it's connecting to another neuron, and these neurons work together in a, in a sequence in order to uh, allow you to move in a smooth way, the neuron can be excited in order to fire faster, or it can be inhibited to fire slower. This inhibitory neuron, this is a neuron coming way out here, coming in here, this is a dopamine neuron. So dopamine is released and, and uh, applied to this neuron to slow it down. So if these dopamine cells coming along here die off, then this cell fires too quickly and you get symptoms. Or basically, the if it fires just a little bit too quickly, your system can become undampened, and if that happens, you can develop trimmer. Uh, if the system is further undampened, uh, then what happens, you can lock up entirely, and that's where, where shuffling starts uh, and rigidity starts. So the DBS electrode comes along, and it shows it kind of zapping this. It doesn't really zap it, but what happens is uh, it fires quickly enough that this neuron can't respond to that quick firing and gets fatigued and then acts like inhibition and slows it down. A very important aspect about this is that this, as this neuron dies off, this dopamine neuron dies off, this junction no longer exists, and all the medications that you can take for Parkinson's work on this junction. So once the disease progresses far enough, the dop the, all the drugs in the world don't work anymore, but the DBS does continue to work because it doesn't need this junction to be here in order for it to work. So DBS works when medications don't. So what does DBS treat? It doesn't treat every symptom of Parkinson's disease. It treats all of the motor symptoms. These are the slowness, that's the, uh, we call that bradykinesia, uh, the facial expression, uh, which is 
honestly, one of the favorite results my patients have when they, um, when they have DBS is the improvement in their facial expression. They themselves don't notice it, but their spouses do and their children do. Uh, it treats the rigidity. Uh, it treats the tremor. But many people have Parkinson's don't have tremor. And you don't have to have tremor in order to have deep brain stimulation. It treats freezing, though freezing can be difficult to treat. It treats fine and coarse motor skills, such as like doing buttons. Um, what it does it not treat? It does not treat postural instability and it does not treat uh, dementia. Postural instability is balance. So it doesn't treat that, it doesn't treat dementia. On the next slide here. So this little cartoon, another thing I, I, I cribbed off the internet, that shows all the things it treats. It treats the, the masked face, it treats the forward flex stoop posture. It treats the rigidity, especially in the back, which oftentimes causes back pain for a lot of patients with Parkinson's. It treats the, the lack of arm swing and the uh, sort of flexion. It treats the tremor in the hands and the legs. Also tremor if you have it elsewhere, maybe the neck. Um, and it treats the shuffling in the gait. So all the things you see here, the things you don't see here, like loss of sense of smell, cognitive changes, um, balance problems, they're not treated by Parkinson's. So it's the things you see here in the picture that are treated. So does DBS work? So with COVID-19 out there or coronavirus, uh, you watch the news and there's a lot of stories about medications. Do they work? Do they not work? We need more studies, et cetera. DBS has those studies. So the studies we wish we had for drugs for COVID-19, we do have for uh, deep brain stimulation. In fact, there are at least five randomized, double-blinded, controlled studies for deep brain stimulation, all of which demonstrate that it works. Here's a list of some of the early ones. When I say double-blinded, randomized, what I mean is there's two groups of individuals, a large groups of individuals, say over 100 people in each group. Um, each individual patient that volunteered for the study does not get the choice as to which group they're in. They either get treatment or they don't. Um, so when they don't get treatment, they get the best medicines that are available. When they get treatment, they get the best medicines plus deep brain stimulation. Um, and then they're, when they're compared, the uh, person who does the comparing, the doctor, uh, doesn't know whether or not they had the surgery or not. So that makes it blinded. And that's the best quality of evidence we can possibly have in medicine. There are very few things with this many um, high quality studies behind it. For example, if you have a, a appendix and you have appendicitis, there is no such thing as a randomized control study for appendicitis. There's no such thing for a randomized control study for many of the drugs that we take. But there is for um, deep brain stimulation. In fact, there's many such studies for deep brain stimulation showing that it, it clearly does work. It also does something else, and this is a study that was done in England. Um, and over here on the left, this, these are two life curves. And notice it starts at one, that's 100%. Uh, and that's at, at year zero. So everybody in the study was alive at year zero. And then if you go out 10 years, people start to pass away. Now, these, this is back when we did DBS only on individuals who were very advanced and, and much older. And so we would expect that the individuals to pass away over time. What we noticed was, is that if you didn't have DBS, uh, you passed away much more quickly. And there was a reason for that, and that was increased cardiovascular problems. And significantly, that means that more than chance for random error, there was a number of individuals passed away from aspiration pneumonia or respiratory problems. And the reason for this is the patients who were treated with deep brain stimulation, that's in the red here, they, um, were more mobile. They were able to get around more easily because their symptoms were treated. Therefore, I get my mouse back here, the individuals here in the red were less likely to develop lung problems because they were up and around. Individuals who had Parkinson's that didn't get treated with DBS, they were less mobile. And by being less mobile and less likely to get up and around, they were more likely to develop lung problems. And those lung problems caused fatalities. Therefore, at 10 years time after DBS, there were 40% greater chance of being alive if you had DBS than if you didn't have DBS. Imagine if that was a cancer drug. If you had a cancer drug for say breast cancer and you say there's a 40% cure rate 
at 10 years, a 40% greater chance of survival, um, it'd be malpractice if you didn't prescribe that. So who is a DBS candidate? Uh, that's, that's probably the most important thing. So if you remember nothing else that I talk about, um, remember this section. The uh, who's a candidate is, is commonly misstated, even by doctors in our community and, and around the country. So if we look at the FDA recommendations, the FDA says you should have the disease for four years. Now, it can be four years after your first symptoms. Now, that's a problem here in Colorado. Our patients here in Colorado are tough. They don't go see doctors very often. Oftentimes, they've had symptoms for many years before they see a doctor at all. So it's not after you've first been diagnosed, but it's after you've had symptoms for four years. Um, as here in Colorado, you might not have had symptoms for three or four years before you ever saw a doctor. And then four months after the motor symptoms are no longer adequately treated with medications. So oftentimes I'll meet somebody who's only been diagnosed for a year or so, but they've had symptoms for many years when I, when I talk to them and, and the medications are not working for them. At that point, they are a candidate for deep brain stimulation. So they, they are. Now, what has to happen is deep brain stimulation has to happen before you have balance problems or cognitive problems. Now, if you have a little balance problems or the balance problems are due to, to shuffling, maybe we can go ahead and do it. But once significant cognitive problems um, develop, then we've really reached the end of the window. We can't do this anymore. So notice where deep brain stimulation fits. It fits after the, after the symptoms have developed. It fits after the symptoms can no longer be treated perfectly with medications. But it's long before advanced Parkinson's occurs, when balance problems start and cognitive problems starts. If you're developing balance problems now and you're thinking pretty clearly, you are nearing the end of the opportunity or the end of the window where we could do deep brain stimulation. In other words, the benefits that we could give you, we can't give you anymore once we get into this area. So to look at that as from a, a different perspective, if we look at the stages of Parkinson's. So this is the stages of Parkinson's. It's actually the medical stages of Parkinson's, but from a cartoon basis. And I like this because it describes it. So at stage one, you have mild symptoms, maybe on one side of the body only, and the medications work really, really well. At stage two, both sides of the body are beginning to be affected, typically, and the tremors or rigidity are starting to get a little bit worse, if you have tremors, you may not. Stage three is when balance problems start to begin. You start to develop slower and slower movement. Stage, now we can still do DBS here, um, but we're starting to get to the end of the window. Stage four, ability to walk um, unassisted starts to go away, so we're having to use a, um, a walker possibly, and we start developing some cognitive issues. And stage five um, really is a point where we need to maybe use a wheelchair to get around and cognitive problems are really evident. So notice in the stages of Parkinson's, where you do DBS is here. It's right after stage one. So your mild symptoms have started to fade. Um, you're taking your medications, they're not working perfectly anymore, and you're starting to show just a little sign of disability. That's when you do DBS because DBS can give you then advantages over arching over all these stages for all these years of life, which may be decade or decades, and give you an increased, pro, uh, what do you call it, increased quality of life during that time. If you wait until here, DBS is unlikely to pull you up out of a wheelchair or, or a, improve your balance enough that you can use not have to use a walker anymore, and it certainly won't help any cognitive issues. And you've really missed the opportunity to have improvements over this, this decade or decades. So I think that's, that's probably, if, if you don't remember anything, that's probably the most important thing to remember, is you want to do it here. You want to do it early. So advances in DBS. Let's talk about those a little bit. DBS is very different than it was five years ago. Now, I've been doing it in practice for 13 years but it is not the same animal that it was 13 years ago. So let's look at some of these things. DBS was historically done as an awake surgery. Um, and this is a gentleman getting it where they're showing him draw on a piece of paper and they're looking at his tremors. He's got a giant frame on the head. The frame is, is an attempt is made to seal this side of the surgery where it's sterile from this side where it's not. Attempt as best as you can. There's a giant, big arcing ring over here on the top, it's called a Lexel head frame. 
What we would do is we pass these electrodes, these tiny little microwire electrodes through the brain in a pattern, and then we would listen to, on a loudspeaker, the firing of cells, these are different kinds of cells, and we'd look at them on a, on a computer screen. And you can tell the difference between certain kinds of cell types. So you can tell the STN cells, where we want to put the electrode, from the anterior thalamus cells, which are right next to it. Um, and I, I did this for a number of years. Once we identify just the right area, we put an electrode in place. An electrode would look like this. However, there were a lot of problems with that surgery. One of the problems was the infection rate was really high. Other problems were that not everybody did that well. And well, here's one of the reasons why not everybody did that well. So when somebody took these microwire electrodes, these are two microwire electrodes, and they're put in really close together. And they were put in, so when they started going into the skull, they were two millimeters apart exactly. So we would expect the bottom to be two millimeters apart exactly as well. And when a CAT scan was done, they found that, you know what, they weren't. They actually varied from anywhere from um, up to three millimeters away from the expected position relative to each other. And the reason for that was those electrodes bent as they went in. They're only a quarter millimeter in diameter, they're really tiny. And so to expect them to go in straight, going through a material like the brain is, is, is wrong. It's, it's not likely to occur. And in fact, if you look at the mathematics of this and you plot a grid out, this is the kind of grid that we'd want to have. This is a model of a subthalamic nucleus, that kind of almond-shaped nucleus. And if we look at what we'd actually get, it looks more like this. It's more scattered. And this creates a lot of inaccuracy or imprecision in our surgery. And that was one of the reasons why people weren't doing as well as we'd expect them to do. When this was looked at um, in France, where they, France is where the surgery was invented, uh, and they, they tried to hit a part of the subthalamic nucleus, and they turned out the part they were aiming for was the pink part, and they only hit it roughly 40% of the time. It turned out another part of the STN they weren't aiming for, they hit that some of the time too, and, and that actually worked out pretty well, and those patients did pretty well, but if they hit the red, the black, or the blue parts, or the yellow parts, people didn't do as well. And it turns out, if you look at it, uh, about... 65% of the time they were in the pink or the green part, but the rest of the time they weren't, which is the explanation for why a third of the patients weren't doing that well when we did it the old way. So remember I said that I, my first patient did very well and I, I really wondered why more people weren't getting this operation. And, and, the, and the problem was is that the operation gave inconsistent results and, and had a lot of complications. That was, that was the problem, and, and the patients were smart. So people with DBS were smart and didn't want to get something where the results weren't, weren't maybe that good. So I started making changes. One of the changes I made was starting to use a little robot. So when we think of a robot, we think of a little man or something like that that uh, moves his arms and legs like a, uh, like a human being. Well, that's not really what we have here. Here what we have is a tiny little device that can sit in your hand and it's able to contort the top part relative to the bottom part. It's got a little arm comes off the back, and you can't really see that that well. And therefore, it can align this arm up to an arbitrary position. And it mounts to the top of the head. So what I can do is I can, I can use that, and I can use a special kind of an MRI, one where uh, my, my patients are asleep, and I can actually target the STN. You can see the STN right there. So many, many practitioners will say you can't see it. Well, you can actually see it quite clearly. That's that black smudge right there, and that's the target where we want to go to. And then using my robot and a live CAT scan in the operating room, here's a picture of an individual that's undergoing a procedure. And, and this individual looks like his head's shaved, but he's not. He's bald. I don't shave the hair at all. Um, so you'll, you'll end up looking after surgery just like you, just like you started. And you can see when I blend that CAT scan with my original MRI, this white dot, let me see if I get my mouse back here, here we go. This white dot right here, that is where the electrode actually ended up. And that electrode is about 1.8 millimeters in diameter. And you can see it's not quite perfect, but it's really, it's really very good. Um, and I actually have almost a guarantee that this is gonna work for this individual rather than in the past, maybe two thirds of the time it would work because I can see it. I can see that the electrode is where I wish it to be. And in fact, actually, I've done a study of this, and, and we published it of, of over 200 electrodes uh, placed, and we've done more than twice this since then. And we, we've averaged out how many times that we had an error. And so this is a picture of actual electrodes, and this is a picture of the actual trajectory for a whole group of electrodes. And you notice that, that they overlap. 
So we were off on average less than the width of the electrode itself. Um, so if the electrode is 1.27 millimeters in diameter, we were off less than about half or roughly about half that electrode. Now we can make it better than that. There's been another set of advances that have occurred in parallel with this. So, and this is what's called steerable current. So all this effort has been made in order to put this electrode in very, very accurately relative to where we wanted to put it, but it's still not exactly perfect. So let's make it exactly perfect. So if you notice this electrode, the electrode I showed before had four contacts, one, two, three, four. This one doesn't have four, this one has eight. And so there's one contact at the bottom, there's one contact at the top, but the contacts in the middle have been split up into three sections. And this is on purpose. By having a steerable current, I can turn on one or two or in combination, and I can move the current backwards, forwards, to the left, to the right, and I can actually correct for any tiny a little bit that the electrode might be off, thereby getting a near perfect result every time. And that's the goal is consistent outcomes nearly every time. We also had some other benefits of this that we really quite frankly weren't shooting for. By doing the operation totally under anesthesia and by doing the operation robotically, we were able to do the operation a lot faster. So this is a publication that came out in 2013 and it compared all of the different ways to do DBS that exist and at least that were surveyed in this study. And there were literally hundreds of different ways of doing deep brain stimulation out there. It's, it's what would you'd expect with any kind of newer, uh, newer therapy, which was new back then. If you look at all these different ways, this is the time it takes in the operating room in order to do this procedure some of them taking more than eight hours. You know, the average taking nearly six hours in the operating room. This is us. So the operation goes much, much quicker. And this is the time in the operating room. The actual time to do the surgery is shorter than that. So it takes 140 minutes in the operating room. It takes about an hour and 45 or so to actually to do the case from start to finish. Now you might think is like, well, that's just rushing through it. But actually, that has some benefits just by going shorter. It reduces the complication rate. So, and one of the major complications of this surgery is infection. So, if you look at the, this is the most recent published uh, publication on infection. It's actually out of Oslo University. This is about what it is in the United States too. There's about three and a half percent of individuals who have a lead place will develop an infection, and that requires that that lead to be removed. And when it's removed, you can, it's not usually the end of the world. Um, you can give antibiotics and those antibiotics um, will usually cure the infection and, and the lead operation can be redone. It can be done at a later date. However, if you look at our operations, and this is old, so we have not, we've done more than twice this many yet again, and we still haven't had any more infections. So, this was about 0.4% back then. We're down around 0.2% now. So by operating more quickly, by operating under general anesthesia, not only is it more comfortable for our patients, not only is, are we able to place the lead exactly where we want to, but it leads to more than 10 times less chance of getting an infection, which is the major complication with the surgery. So I'll leave it at that and I'll start to take questions. I've shortened this up quite a bit for this webinar. Um, and at this point, we, we can uh, take some questions and, uh, and I can answer anything you might have. Okay, so it looks like we did have a couple of questions come in while you were talking. The first is from Larry and his spouse and the, it, it is, what is the percentage of people who have trouble getting the modular adjusted the first time? So I think that's actually, you really shouldn't expect that the device will be adjusted perfectly the first time. Um, if you have Parkinson's disease, you should expect it's gonna take anywhere from four to five visits to as many as eight or 10 adjustment visits to get it right. 
And the reason for that is the complexity of Parkinson's disease. There's many different symptoms with Parkinson's disease and there's many different medications our patients are on when they first come in. And so the medications are typically reduced by about 50%. Um, and as we're reducing those medications, I'll probably stop sharing the screen so I can talk. Well, I'll just leave it up there. As we're reducing those medications, we are increasing the stimulation. And during that process, it is not uncommon to overshoot and undershoot and be on a bit of a roller coaster ride after the electrodes have been placed for about three months until it's until it's dialed in. So I would say almost no one with Parkinson's would have the stimulator adjusted perfectly the first time. But you should expect after about three months of working quite a bit with your neurologist that it should be working about 95% as well as it's ever going to, you know, after about three months time for most individuals. Awesome. And this is a follow-up question to that one. Uh, Larry has to be off of uh, off of a blood thinner when he's having the surgery. Do you feel the rechargeable battery might be better for him because surgery is more dangerous due to the blood thinner? Maybe. So that is a definite maybe answer. So I would say that the and this is sponsored by Abbott, but I'm going to give you a, a, a realistic um, answer no matter what. The there are three different companies which make uh, DBS systems currently. So that's Medtronic, Boston Scientific, and Abbott. And if you look at those, Boston Scientific and Abbott both have steerable current, but Medtronic does not. And, and given that, at the present time, I, I feel that everybody should either have an Abbott or a Boston Scientific because they'll get better results. Um, and, or at least, more likely to get better results. And, and when I look at my goal as a doctor, my, my goal is to give you better results. So I would say you, you need to select one of those two. Now of those two, both of those two are very well made. They both have steerable current. They're both MRI compatible with the Abbott's being effectively not rechargeable and the Boston Scientific's being rechargeable. They're both very good choices. However, what we're noticing is when you place two Abbott batteries, so it's the two smaller Infinity 5s, one on the left and one on the right, that it's likely to last six to seven years without having a battery recharge. Now, the Boston says that their device lasts 15 years or up to 15 years. Now, I have a significant amount of experience with this because the Abbott, or sorry, the Boston rechargeable device has been on the market now um, for quite some time, but as a spinal cord stimulator for different purpose. And I happen to know that after about not, somewhere between nine and 11 years, averaging about 10, it needs to be replaced. So it might last up to 15 years in some cases, but in practice, it lasts about 10. So whether having it 10 years in, in your body before it has to be replaced, but yet you have to recharge it a couple of times a week, whether that's better than having it last seven years and you don't have to recharge it, well, that's that's an interesting choice, and I let my patients choose uh, for that choice. Most of my patients would rather not have to interact with it or, or do anything on a, on a daily basis or several times a week, um, and would just simply say seven years is good enough. But there are other individuals that, that would choose otherwise, and, and I'll make a Boston available for them. It's a long What's answer that? to your question, sorry. <laughs> No worries, no worries. Uh, the next question that we have is from Scott Stockton. And his question is, the DBS equipment okay around micro microwave ovens and what are the problems going through airport security? So both of those are very, very good questions. Um, I've never heard of a problem with a microwave oven. Um, one could imagine some kind of a faulty microwave oven where it was on while the door is open or something like that, but that could be bad for you even if you didn't have DBS. Um, so, so I've never had a problem with that at all. Um, there are some limitations for um, DBS, and we should probably talk about those. Uh, for flying, there is no issue flying. Uh, my patients fly on a routine, regular basis. Um, Denver is a, is a hub, um, and in fact, I operate on many patients from the, especially from the East Coast, that, that fly in for me to do their operation out of state. So, about 20% of my operations are out of state. Um, so, so flying occurs all the time. What I would tell you if you're gonna fly is tell the TSA that you have a brain pacemaker. If you say DBS, they may not know what you're talking about, but if you say you have a brain pacemaker, they'll figure that out and they'll hand wand you and they'll move you right on through. 
it is against the manufacturer's recommendation to go through the machine where you stand up and you put your arms up and it scans you. And it's also against the recommendations to go through a metal detector. That said, I've had patients do both accidentally at various different times and nothing bad has happened to them. So it's not likely something bad is going to happen to you. But, um, but it's still, I tell them, tell them you have a brain pacemaker and, and they should be able to um, hand wand you and get you right on through without, without delay. Um, that said, there are some restrictions. Uh, you shouldn't weld. So using arc welding, you can gas weld because welding puts out electrostatical discharge and we don't know how much. No one's ever measured it. That doesn't mean you can't be around somebody welding and they're welding across the street and you see they're doing it. That should be fine. They don't want you to be the one that does it. There's an older uh, physical therapy called diathermy. They don't want you doing that. Um, th nobody uses it anymore anyway, so it, so it doesn't matter. It's very old. And if you dive in the ocean, they don't want you diving more than, I think it's 30 feet. Cindy might be able to correct me. Um, so there's limitation. What they're worried about is the can crushing in the chest. That said, I've had somebody dive to 90 feet and sent me an underwater picture of them doing it and, and they live through it fine. But again, don't do that, please. Um, but those are the only real restrictions. You can get an MRI, um, but MRIs have, uh, there's an MRI mode uh, on the devices and you need to set it into those modes. Um, if you need to get an MRI, it's probably best if you call my office so I can advise the center um, what needs to be done, uh, and we can we can help you out with that. You can get the high quality MRIs with good pictures if if you if you need to. Okay, so our next question is from Larry and his spouse again, and going back to the qualifications. So the psychological test is two to four hours long. What exactly will keep them from having the surgery based on this test? So in my practice, this differs from different practices. So in many practices, if you have depression or some anxiety, they will exclude you from doing deep brain stimulation. I don't. Um, so I just, just ask that those things be treated. The big thing that will exclude you is cognition. So once dementia sets in, I am forbidden from doing this surgery by the FDA, um, as well as by the insurance companies, and, and, and certainly also partially by ethics. Um, now, there's no definition of what, how much cognitive decline equals dementia. We don't, we don't define that. And everybody with Parkinson's probably has some level of cognitive decline. And, and so we'll pick up that sometimes and, and still allow people to go through because it, it doesn't represent complete frank dementia. But that goes to what I was saying earlier. In the, um, in the recommendations for doing deep brain stimulation, you really wanna do this early where there's not gonna be any problems with the, um, the neurocognitive testing and we can fly right through that step and you'll get benefit for many, many years out of the system rather than waiting to the end and then sweating whether or not that, that the, the cognitive test is gonna be okay. Okay, so our next question is from Scott again. Are the adjustment protocols simpler with benign essential tremors? Yes, actually, I didn't know anybody was going to be on the call with essential tremor. Um, and so I didn't specifically address that in the talk, but I'm glad you asked the question. It is much, much easier to adjust the device for essential tremor than it is for Parkinson's disease. Uh, the reason why is, is typically the medications for essential tremor don't really work very much. And, and simply stopping the medications doesn't really change anything too much either. And so because of that, we can simply have you, for the most part, stop your medications and then go about our business adjusting to control the one symptom, which is the essential tremor. Um, and so oftentimes you can get that adjusted in one to three or four visits total instead of, you know, you know a half to a third is what would be required for, for Parkinson's disease. It's very, very much easier. Awesome. So our next question is from Adele. The CS for Abbott, oh, he says that they just extended it to 100 feet for diving. Oh, 100 feet for diving. So there you go. So one of our Abbott reps uh, chimed in and uh, I didn't know that. So that that's fantastic. Uh, and so it must have just happened. Um, that's good. So that means that anywhere you could dive with open water diving certification, 
I happen to be an, an open water diver. You can't dive below 100 feet anyway without special certification. So anywhere you could normally dive, then you could go with the Abbott system. So there you go. Awesome. So our next question is from Madeline and she asked, are there any differences in outcome based on gender? No, no, the simple answer is no. Um, the, it, it's reasonably split equally with men and women with Parkinson's and essential tremor. The, the symptoms for essential tremor tend to be a little different for men and women, but not significantly so. And the outcomes tend to be about the same for men and women as well. So no, this is not one, one of those diseases that, that tends to favor one gender much more than another, a little bit, but, but, but not in any significant way. Great, and Patrick asks, does insurance normally cover the surgery? Yes, yes, that's an excellent question. Um, so all major insurances, uh, Medicare and Medicaid, all pay for it. Um, and we at Denver DBS Center accept everything. So, in fact, I accept insurances from, I, I'm on like Blue Cross with Blue Shield of New York, New Jersey, Florida, um, like South Carolina, Maryland. You, you wouldn't think that it would be here in Denver, but but people come here from those states. So, we we try to take everything. Every once in a while, somebody shows up with something that, that we've never heard of, um, and that will delay us just a little bit while we get to sign up for that insurance. Uh, and so, we'll have to send them some letters and you know, certain processes we have to go through, but we'll do that. Um, so our goal is to treat anybody, no matter what insurance they have. Um, this, the reason why the insurances cover it and Medicare and Medicaid cover it is because there is that, all that evidence that we showed, those papers which show that it works, um, it's called tier one evidence. So if there's multiple different tiers of evidence, one is the very best and anything in tier one is automatically covered by everything. So, so that's why we don't have a problem with it. That's awesome. Okay, so we just got a couple, a bunch more. Uh, so our next question is from Madeline again. How likely, likely will medications be reduced for Parkinson's and which meds are they? Amantadine? Um, amantadine, typically you take amantadine if you have some dyskinesia problems and almost always we eliminate that medication if you have DBS. Sometimes not, but almost always that's eliminated entirely. Medication should be reduced for Parkinson's by about 50%. So you need about 50% less medications than you had before. Oftentimes your, your neurologist may choose to keep you on Azolect. That's kind of one of the more expensive ones, but there's a tiny little bit of evidence that it might slow down the progression of the disease. Um, and the evidence is not very good, but the risk of Azolect is pretty low. And so, so they, they will often want to keep you on that. Any form of levodopa that you take, um, that could be in the form of Cinemet, oftentimes called Carbidopa Levodopa, or Ritari, if you happen to take that. Any form of that should be reduced by, by half, um, uh, typically. Now, many patients come in undertreated, so it'll be reduced by less than half because they, were, they weren't taking enough to begin with. And some people come in overtreated and reduced way more than half. And so, so it's, it's an average, but, but half is about right. Okay, so this is a question from Patrick again. Uh, he was diagnosed in December of 2017. Is it too early to consider DBS? He's currently having some good results with Ritari. So um, repeat that again. How long ago was he diagnosed? Uh, on December 27th, 2017. 2017. So it's not necessarily too early to consider it. Um, I have a lot of patients that come see me and you know we sit and we talk and we go through all the evidence and we and, and we say listen it's too early you know you probably don't need to do it now but you're now on the radar you also can sit down and have a, a total you know one hour visit with me um, we can go through everything in great detail and oftentimes the result of it is let's talk next year you know and and you know sometimes we talk next year and then the result of that is let's talk the year after um, but you're on the radar, and so when you when you do become a candidate, we can actually act early um, and not not artificially wait uh, when we when we didn't need to. So so I'm never going to operate on somebody too early, but it's never too early to come see me and talk about it. Okay, so our next question is from Madeline, and it's in reference to recovery time. So what does the recovery period look like? in terms of time and activity level, work and exercise? Excellent question. 
the the process is a three-step process to do this surgery so the first step is getting the mri um, and you would think that's not much of a step but but we do do it under anesthesia because we don't want you moving at all during that so we can get that high accuracy lead placement the next day we do the major surgery that's where um, we put the electrodes in place and that's the one where it was 139 minutes in the operating room and then about a week later we put the generators in we do that as an outpatient and, and usually in a surgery center uh, the only time you stay overnight in the hospital is actually that that's that surgery the uh, one right after the mri and typically it's only one day so it's one day in the hospital total that said when you go through three anesthesias in a week and you know you've, one of them is a brain surgery you should expect to be just a little off and not quite yourself for about two or three weeks so for my younger patients oftentimes about uh, three weeks is sufficient to recover for the whole ordeal. For my older patients, it might be more like four or five weeks. And it's not like it's a bad, painful recovery. It isn't. Um, the, there's actually not a particularly painful operation at all. Um, it's just that, uh, that you just might not quite feel like yourself. You're just kind of tired, fatigued, a little difficulty concentrating. Um, that, that then clears with time. Great. So this is from Larry and his wife again. How long will Larry have to be off of his blood thinners for surgery? Minimum and maximum times. It depends on what blood thinner he's on. Um, so so uh, not being able to ask the uh, ask back. But if you're on something like Coumadin, we'd want you to be off for a week, but we'd likely bridge you with another medication such as um, Lovenox. We took some shots leading up to surgery and you'd only be off for a couple of days before or one day before actually, um, and then uh, be off a couple of days afterwards. So we'd keep you off about three days total. Um, and the same thing in around putting the generators in place. So it was a very short period of time. Now, if you're on a drug like Eliquis, we can just stop it two days in advance. We don't have to do the bridging drug, which is kind of nice. Um, so we'll do that instead. So it looks like he, if they wrote in and said warfarin? Warfarin, so warfarin, warfarin is committed, sorry. same drug. So in his case, we would bridge him. So we would use something like Lovenox to bridge him. So he's not he's not unprotected. So he'd be, he'd be off the Coumadin for a week, but we protect him with another medication leading right up to surgery, be off a day before and a couple of days afterwards and back on the medication again. Great. Uh, this is from Patrick again. Is there anything that I should be doing in preparation for future surgery since he's a relatively new patient? Um, so not 100% what sure what he's asking. I believe what he's asking is in preparation for um, for DBS surgery, or uh, so I assume that's what he means. So if you're in preparation for DBS, no, there's nothing in particular you need to do for it, um, but I think it's never too early to come see someone like myself, and so we can go through things in, in detail, and you know what to expect, and, and, and more importantly, when to expect it. I think that's probably the bigger thing. So you know the signs to look for, that the red flags are going, okay, it's time to have my surgery. Um, Afterwards, it's probably an important thing to know, and he might have been asking this, is after having your DBS implanted, you can have other surgeries. It's not a problem. Sometimes your surgeons will um, want to know more details about it, and they'll want to give me a call, and that's totally okay. So the, that happens all the time. And But typically, there's no restrictions on getting other surgeries. We just have to put your device in a surgery mode so it's protected during that surgery, and that's easy enough to do. Great. Our next question comes from George Forrestal, and he asks, if he is on Kaiser Permanente, are you able to perform the surgery? Uh, unfortunately, no. Um, many individuals with Kaiser actually, and it has nothing to do with me, Kaiser is happy enough for me to see you, and oftentimes will allow an exception for me to, to see you as your doctor. But what they won't allow me to do is I can't operate in their hospital, and you have to do everything in their facilities. So that's where the, the sticking point comes in, and that's how they control their cost. Unfortunately, Kaiser doesn't have anybody in our system that does it like we do, where it's asleep with this high-precision robotic surgery. Many of my patients, if they're, if they're older, over 65, because you can enroll every year, will actually come and see me um, in advance, and you, and you can see me in the office for not much money. It's not an expensive visit. Um, and make plans to do surgery and actually enroll in a different insurance um, and then do surgery after that. So I've, I've 
had that happen about four or five times a year. So I, I can't necessarily advocate that you do that, but it, but it does happen about four or five times a year that somebody comes and goes, I want you to do this surgery and I want you to do it in November. And I'll ask, why in November? Because my open enrollment is in uh, November 1st. I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, so, so we do that on a, on, a, on a regular basis. Okay, so our next question is from Terry and she asks, does DBS help with dyskinesias? Very much so. Um, in fact, that's actually one of the main reasons somebody might choose to do it. It's not the only main reason, but it's, it's one of the main reasons. The reason why is it provides an alternative way to treat your motor symptoms of your Parkinson's with less medications. The dyskinesias are a side effect of your medications. And what it usually is a side effect of is too much levodopa, um, either in the form of carbidopa, levodopa called Cinemet, or in the form of Ritari, or but also some of the dopamine agonists can do it as well. And we can reduce that medication and eliminate the number of medications, like I said, by, by typically well more than half. And then we can treat your symptoms using the DBS, thereby eliminating your dyskinesia. So typically we can eliminate dyskinesia with DBS in the end. Now it can take a couple of months to get a program just right for that to happen, uh, but we can almost always completely eliminate your dyskinesia. That's great. Uh, our next question is, comes from Patrick. If you, if I understood you correctly, if you are having balance issues, it is too late to have DBS. What if your balance issues are minor? Can you cover the balance problems again? Yes, so if your balance problems are minor, that, that tells us we, if we're gonna ever do DBS in your lifetime, we need to do it now. Um, so on that little scale that I showed you with the cartoons, you're getting towards the end. You're not there. So, and like I said, is, is just be, cognitive problems are an absolute no. Balance problems are a caution flag. So we're getting that yellow light coming up at the stoplight. So what it tells me is if you want to do this and benefit from it over your lifetime is we need, we need to hustle. Okay. And our next question comes from George. Can you explain where the leads are placed and how large the implanted device is? I can. Um, I could demonstrate for you if you could. Actually, are you seeing me or are you seeing the um, my screen? Actually, Cindy can. I have one too right here. So let's see if people can see this at all. Yeah. So are you? Are they seeing my screen or are they seeing? Um, can they see they're, that? They're up? seeing David's screen. <laughs> Hang on a second. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing right. to figure out how the. Uh, No, that doesn't do it. I'm going to change the presenter back to you. And that should that should do it. Okay. Yeah. Let me. There you go. And then we'll go. There we go. So now, hopefully, everybody can see. Oh, maybe not. And there's the battery too. You guys see that? There there we go. go. Hopefully. <laughs> So hopefully, hopefully we can see. So Cindy will hold up. Um, that's the electrode. That's the actual electrode. It's one and a quarter. It's actually 1.27 with exactly millimeters in diameter, and that goes down in the brain um, a couple of inches. And that's mm -hmm. a generator. Is that an infinity five or seven? This is a five. Five. So that's the smaller ones that I typically use. Seven. There's a seven. So I typically use two of the smaller ones, one on each side, because it makes much less of a um, stress on your skin than one of the bigger ones. And, and I do that no matter what manufacturer you use, I'll use two of their smaller ones. That's the typically direction I'll go. Okay, so our next question is, do most DBS surgeons in Denver perform the surgery the same as you, asleep? No. No, um, uh, it's unique to me. So the I actually did not invent this method. Um, I copied it from some gentlemen on the West Coast, um, uh, both in Oregon and in San Francisco area. And then, but I was the one that adapted it to robotics. And uh, so I was the first one in the world to do that, as far as we know. And then what's interesting is then I actually taught some other people on the West Coast how to do it. So Stanford now does it like I do. Uh, so it's kind of funny. There's just, you know, some guy here in Denver who taught somebody in Stanford how to do it. Um, and it's propagated itself throughout the West. 
So if you look in the Western United States, if you were to go to Phoenix, you go to Oregon, um, you go to at least half of California, this is how you would do the surgery. Um, however, in the Eastern United States, it has not fully caught on, and it's only caught on, I would say, through half of Denver. So for example, this is the only way I do it, um, because the, the accuracy, the outcomes, and the complication rates are so much better. Um, however, there, you know, other programs here in Denver still do it the old way, as, as if they were in, in the East Coast. Awesome. So we've got a couple more written questions, and it looks like we have someone's hand raised as well. We'll okay. start with the written questions. What are the downside risks of DBS? I think that's excellent. So there's two major ones, and I will talk to everybody in person to make sure they understand these risks before I'll ever do the surgery. Uh, and those are, you have a small risk of having a stroke. Uh, what that is, is really bleeding inside the brain. So if you have bleeding inside the brain, then um, uh, it's like you have permanent neurologic disability or a stroke, and, and that's horrible if it happens. Now, the reality from putting an electrode in, I've never actually had that occur. Um, the other major risk is an infection. And infections was really the Achilles heel of this operation for many years. Um, I think we finally got it under control. Doing a sleep robotic surgery by placing the batteries under the muscle, which I do, which protects the battery better from, from eroding through the skin. Uh, we changed the way we closed the incisions. Um, all those things in combination have allowed us to reduce that infection. Well, in fact, our last infection was in 2014. Now, knock on wood is, you know, I don't, I don't know when the next one is going to be. I hope, hopefully not soon. Um, and that, but that risk is there. So you have to know about it. But now that's, that's been minimized. Other risks is if you had severe cognitive problems, we would really worry about making your cognitive situation maybe a little bit worse. And so we don't want you to have severe cognitive problems before we do this. Um, and the last one is, is sometimes if you have severe balance issues, we might be able to make that just a little bit worse. So something else we want to watch for. Okay, so let's try doing a live question. Well, so Elaine, we have your hand raised. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you and you can ask your question. Oh, maybe not. Or, can you hear is. me now? Hi, Elaine. Yes, you can. Okay, so the new Abbott systems have eight instead of four on the leads? Yes, ma'am, that's correct. And how long has that been? Um, actually, Cindy could probably tell me. It's been about two years, I believe. Yeah, October of 16 was when it was approved. Okay. Tells how fast time goes by because it's October. I've actually used it since it first came out. So, uh, that, and that's actually, I've been using those exclusively. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Aileen. Okay, so we've got a couple more written questions. We'll go ahead and go through these and then just for the sake of time, we'll wrap it up if that's okay. So our next question is from Madeline, is what char characteristics should we look for in a DBS surgeon? Uh, what character, so outcomes. How good do their patients do? That's the number one thing. And so we do, the only thing you really care about is I try to be a nice guy, but quite frankly, if somebody's a jerk, and they get and their patients do really well that's what you really really should care about is um that uh that their patients do well and so i track my outcomes i track how well my patients do and it's a constant effort to uh, make the surgery better and better and better as the years have gone by um and if uh if, if somebody tells you things like all my patients do well that's not tracking their outcomes so you should, they should be able to tell you statistically, what are the odds of an electrode not ending up in an accurate location? What are the odds of getting an infection? They should know that um, for the patients that they treat because nobody has perfect results every time. And if they tell you that, then they're not telling the truth. Awesome. So our next question comes from Patrick. If he's interested in discussing his situation, should I first request input from my current physician, who he really admires? You can, um, but you can also just come directly to me, or you can do both. So um, I run an open center 
What that means is I work with any neurologist um, that's that's out there, including neurologists from competing programs. Um, that that actually does happen. Um, so I would be uh, I'd be happy to to see you directly. Uh, nowadays, by the way, we're doing video conferencing just like this. Uh, so you can actually see me through video because of the whole COVID-19 outbreak. We'll go back to in-person, you know, at, at some point in the future. Um, so you can either go through your, your current physician. You can you can come directly to see me or you could just do both. Great. And so our last question for today, just so that we're sticking to time, is from William, can you turn it off when you sleep, your DBS when you sleep, or is there a risk of overstimulation if it's always on? An excellent question. I'm gonna give you a different answer for different diseases. So for Parkinson's disease, you're better off having chronic stimulation over time. You'll have a better effect if the stimulation runs all day and all night. On the other hand, for essential tremor, about 20% of the population habituates to the uh, stimulation. What that means is they develop like a resistance to it and their tremor will start to come back. But if they turn it off at night, that won't happen. It sort of resets the brain if it was. The problem is you don't know if you're in that 20% or not when you first have the surgery. So we recommend everybody turn it off at night and maybe that actually saves the battery a little bit and makes the battery last longer too. Um, so for essential tremor, we prefer people turn it off at night and for Parkinson's disease, we prefer they just leave it on all the time. Okay, so we actually have one more question. Is it all right if we sure, away. squeeze it in? Okay, uh, this one, our last question is from Madeline. What is the difference between STI and G? Why pick one side over the other? An excellent question. And, and honestly, in studies, they've been shown to be relatively equivalent. So if one doctor says I wanna do one and one doctor says I wanna do another, or maybe a doctor who does both is struggling to try to figure out which one's the best one for you, that's probably okay. Um, we do both. Uh, and typically, I will use the GPI for my older patients. Maybe they have some balance problems already or having the beginnings of cognitive problems. And the, that opportunity is starting to, to do DBS is starting to close. Um, and, and I do that because it doesn't have that tremendous impact of improvement right away, but it does, do, it does well. Um, but it also doesn't have, um, it, it doesn't make those issues worse if you, if you have those issues. On the other hand, for my younger patients, um, you know, patients that are on a lot of medications, I'll typically use the SDN because you get a huge bang for your buck. The, um, you end up with more rapid improvement, much more rapid reduction in your medications, um, and, and, and a lot of an impact much more quickly if you use the SDN. So I'll typically shoot for that uh, for my younger patients. And I will discuss that with everybody individually to try to pick out the best target. It doesn't change how we do the surgery, it just changed where I line it up. Great, so I think that's all the questions we have for right now, but thank you so much to you, Dr. Van Zickel, and also Cindy for taking some time out of your Friday and coming to speak with us. All right, thank you all and everybody stay safe. Thanks. Yes. And if anybody has any questions, please feel free to send them to my email. We'll try to get those answered for you. And then make sure you download all of the handouts off to the off to the side. There's some really good stuff over there. So be sure to download it. All right. And just a reminder on the app card, if you do want to be updated on future events, make sure and fill that out and send it in. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you guys again. And everybody have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.